So I want to continue talking um, this morning. We've been just so being refreshed. Have you, how many guys have just been enjoying Pastor Zach sharing about our significance? I'm just getting so rocked and so so much revelation. So I just want to continue that and kind of share my heart and my story about that. And so um, I want to read this scripture. Zach went over it, but this is what I want to kind of hone in today for myself. Um, and it is... Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 6. And I don't even know what translation I wrote in here, but surprise. Okay, how blessed is God and what a blessing. It's the message. Okay, my husband, he's so on the front row to make sure I am official. Uh, How blessed is God and what a blessing he is. He's the father of our master, Jesus Christ, and takes us to the high places of blessing in him. Long before he laid down earth's foundation, he had us in mind. He settled on us as the focus of his love. He, to be made whole and be holy by his love. If that is not underlined, highlighted, written on a post-it note somewhere, you need to do it. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. And what pleasure he took in planning this. You are not an accident. Redemption wasn't an accident. It wasn't like, oh, dang it, they sinned. Let me figure out a way to make this work. He took pleasure in planning redemption. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. Father, thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for your people, the opportunity it is to serve them by bringing the word. I count it a blessing, an honor, and a privilege. And I pray that your words would go to hearing ears and change hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, how many have enjoyed quarantine? How many, some crazy stuff has happened during quarantine? Um. Quarantine 15 happened in our house. If you guys don't know what that is, it's called you're stuck at home and you're learning how to bake and cook, and so you gain 15 pounds. I don't know if it was quite 15, but um, not to put my whole family on blast, but we before we left, we went to um, Sedona, which is beautiful. It's like the rim of Grand Canyon um, in Arizona, and we did a family vacation because at the time, Arizona was totally open. Um, and so we could go anywhere you want. You can go to restaurants and in Vegas, it was all on lockdown. So it was just like this refreshing thing and we're all out there and it's beautiful and hot. So we're all in our bathing suits. And, and I was like, dang, I think the quarantine 15 hit every person in my family. (laughs) Uh, They love me. I mean, you know, if it happens to me, I can talk about it. Um, Another thing that happened that was really terrible was TikTok. How many TikTok happened in your family during quarantine? All right, so I'm not preaching to the choir, but so, you know, some things just happen. You're just like, I am, all of a sudden, I'm a homeschool mom. I wasn't even prepared to be a homeschool mom, and I have, you know, like all these kids. I had a first grader. And Josiah was seventh grade, and Hannah was ninth grade, and my, my son was a senior. So I've got like four kids. I'm trying to help homeschool, and I'm going to pull my hair out. So it's like, yeah, Layla, if you want to spend the rest of the day on an iPad, I don't care. I'm done. <laughs> Seven hours a day on an iPad, sure. You know, I mean, how many moms out there are just like, I was figuring it out. Like, it was not okay for me. So my Layla, she found TikTok. We have since adjusted what that looks like. It's, about pro- it's probably the worst app ever. Like, we thought Snapchat was the worst, and now TikTok came. I know some of you guys are looking at me like, I don't know what you're talking about. I have teenagers, so I have to know all these things. Um, you know, I have to be in the business. <laughs> A little short side story. When my kids come home from school, I take that 15-minute drive, or however long it is, to get all the gossip. And I'll tell you why. I mean, I like gossip, but um, the reason is, is I want to know 
who's dating who and who's breaking up with who and who, be, why do I want to know? Because I want my heart to be open to my kids so when they need to tell me something, they have always been able to trust me with whatever they need to say. There's no judgment. There's no criticism. I want to know what's going on. And so I've created that environment with my with my kids. I was texting with my sister-in-law yesterday, and she's got twin girls that are um, 12 years old. And I'm like, bless you, my child. I've been there. And she's a single mama, so she's got to, like, just, you know, it's not easy. I, f I think 12 to 15 the, of girls is the hardest part of parenting. Can we just say a prayer for the Hogans? Just <laughs> oh, they have the most amazing girls. So uh, my Layla found TikTok, and I remember this. Uh, oh, did I step up? Okay. So maybe, like, um, two or three weeks ago. I'm watching what she's recording on her TikTok, and, and it's like this sad song, and she has a sad face, and she wrote on the top, I moved to New York, and I miss my family and my cousins and my friends. And so I'm looking at this TikTok, and, I'm, and then I look at her, and I'm like, are you, like, are you, are you really sad, honey? And then she just starts to burst into tears. And I was like, okay, I got to deal with something right here. Like, this is something my daughter is feeling. And how many know it's okay to feel things? It's okay to have emotions. And I told her, it's okay to be sad. It's okay to miss your family. Um, it's okay to miss your nana and your papa and your cousins and your friends. And we're going to talk through that. And so I have been purposely making time when I feel like she might be feeling a certain way. So the other night, she was wanting to cuddle in my lap, and she fell asleep. And so I went to go put her in her bed. One of the blessings of moving up here is for the first time, she's got her bed and her room and her space. And I think for her age, it's really important. So I lay her in bed, and she wakes up. And she's like, lay with me. So I did. I laid with her. And as I'm laying with her, she's like, she's really falling asleep, but every once in a while, she'll like, peek her eye halfway open, and she's like, oh, okay, you're still here, and then she'll close her eyes again, and then everyone's she's like, peeks her eye open, and as I was sitting looking at her face, I began to feel the heart of the Father for me, and I think, how many times do I live like Layla, running all around, crazy like a little girl, doing all of the things I want to do. And I just want to peek my eye open to make sure I can still see his face. And he's always right there. And something about being in the gaze of Papa's eyes changes everything about my life. In that moment with her, with Layla, I could feel her heart settle. I could feel the angst about being in a place she might not know so well start to, start to be comforted just by sitting in bed, laying face to face with Mama, counting all her freckles, looking at her cute little face. She's cuter when she's sleeping. I'm not sure why that happens. <laughs> Moms get it, right? It's like, you're like, you're so sweet and precious when you're sleeping. Can you stay that way? <laughs> so I try to remind myself when I want to go crazy that she's cute. Um, but how we see God, it affects how we see ourselves, and it affects how we live out our life, because how I see myself is how I represent who God is to the world. For years and years and years in church, we are taught to hate ourselves. And why are we taught that? Because we're taught we're nothing, we're nobody, we're dirt, we're scum. And, um, you know, you hear songs about how you're a worm on the Christian radio station, and you're just like, I don't understand that. Um, I remember Zach said something last week. The blood of Jesus doesn't make you valuable, it proves you're valuable. You know, the first time he said that at our church in Vegas, somebody walked out and he got a phone call later, <laughs> asked for a scripture. Zach was like, uh, John 3.16? <laughs> 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 
there's basic things we're taught because religion is easy. It is easy for me to create an environment of rigid rules so my children obey instead of a place of harmony where my children, uh, the response from them is heart-to-heart connection. Which is why in church, it's easy for leaders to create an environment of rules and regulations, and you can't do this and you can't do that, because it's easier to control people than it is to give them an option to live out their life fully before God. And control is rooted in fear. And we're afraid of what it looks like when we let people run. And it's why we have these these, um, theologies and these things in the church that try to keep us from living out our life before God because what if it doesn't look like what I thought it was going to look like? I just... I I feel like there's so many things um, that we do and we teach, and it's still, even we we can call it like, we can call it, oh, like new covenant teaching, but it's still lived out in this old covenant paradigm. Because freedom is freedom. But if I don't see God as a loving God who gives me a choice, then I won't live free. I'll live bound. How I see God affects how I see myself, and then it affects how I live out my life. And we wonder why people aren't living free, because we're not telling them who God really is. So for me, I was raised in the church. Just a little bit of story about my life. Not that anybody really cares, but it just gives some perspective of, oh, thanks, honey. I love you. I was raised in the church. My mom's a single mom. She's amazing. You guys are going to meet her. She'll be here next week. You'll love her. She is so bubbly and prophetic and amazing. All of you guys are just going to love us more because you'll love her. I promise. Um, she is a pit bull in the spirit. She is just, I, I can't even tell you how many sleepovers turned into God encounters. I literally stopped having sleepovers. I was just like, if you come to my house, my mom is going to preach to you. I'm, I, you know, you're going to get saved. So let's just get through it. Then we can have fun. It's just the way that it was growing up. That's just my mom. Um, and my mom is amazing, and she taught me how to love Jesus, and she taught me how to be open to the Holy Spirit. But because my father wasn't around, I still had this distorted view of who God was. I was still trying to, you know, when you're a little girl and your parents get divorced, it doesn't matter how many times your mom tells you it's not your fault, you still think it's your fault. You just do. Or you feel like, especially if they start a new family, you feel like, well, what did they do that was good enough to keep my dad? What did I do that was right? It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how mature you are. That's what you feel until you get healed. It's just, it it is what it is. So I grew up with this thing like, I'm not good enough for my dad to love me. So how would I be ever good enough for God to love me? And because of it, I lived out my Christian life for a very long time trying to do all of the right things. And as soon as I made a mistake, it was my world crumbling in front of me. And so on the outside, I had it all together, very controlled. I still attempt to live my life that way. Um, who, Who likes Enneagrams? I'm, okay, there's like, okay, work with me, people. Answer. Okay, if you don't know what Enneagram is, it's like a personality test thing. And I'm a total three, which is like the perfectionist control three freak that wants to be in charge. Um, and some parts of me, that's a very not healthy thing. But then there's parts of me that it is healthy. Um, it's good for me to have that kind of personality when I'm raising five kids. Because then they all understand the expectations of mom and they do it. Right? Children? Answer. Yes. Thank you. But also a part of me has to make sure everybody thinks I have everything 
together. And that you guys all think that my laundry is currently done and my bed is made and there's nothing on my sink in my bathroom. And if you guys think that, you'll think better of me because you'll think that I have it all together. And it's just an illusion. And it's done out of a place of, I need people to, fi- to know that I am doing the right thing and I need people to feel like I have it all together so that I can live out my life better. And it's all an illusion that crumbles in the presence of the Lord. Because without him, without him, it doesn't matter. Without understanding who he is and his gaze on me and how he sees me, none of that, none of my control, none of my ability to have it together makes any difference. So, um, we were talking about an, an eclipse the other day. And so a solar eclipse, we just had one, I think in February, I don't know. Um, I just remember everybody went outside to look at how beautiful the moon was. But a solar eclipse is when the moon covers the sun. And sometimes what happens is our images of God cover how we actually see him. And it's like an eclipse. And you know what happens? The light gets darker. And I think most of the time, we live our life in the eclipse of who God is. Because of our history of being controlled and our history of being, being moved to a place of fear to do the right thing, once we know who God is, we're accountable for who God is, and if we don't live free and we still live in fear, then we live in that accountability of, I know who God really is, but I'm still living shackled. Second Corinthians 4, 6, it says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. He showed us who he really is by showing us Jesus. And we read Jesus and forget that that's what God looks like. We do. I do. You know? Sometimes, um, sometimes I'll wake up and I'll, you know, if I get sick or something or, you know, God forbid we ever get sick in our bodies. I mean, I feel like we're supposed to live in divine health, but sometimes things happen. And so I'll wake up and I'll be sick or something and I'll feel like, God, what did I do? And it's like ingrained in my mind that somehow God uses sickness to punish And that's so the enemy. That is not the heart of God. That's not who he is. But because of our, our, just our mindsets and because we've been taught it for so long, it's like, Jesus, get this out of my head. Why does that, why is that what I revert to? That's not your heart. Because I see who you are revealed in Jesus. And everywhere I look through the Gospels, what did Jesus do? Who Jesus is? You know, for um, being a woman, and especially being a woman in ministry, I love to to teach and preach, and and it doesn't have to be a room full of kids or women, so some people don't like it, and um, I don't care. But I look at the life of Jesus, and I think, gosh, if we just understood the way Jesus saw women, it would have change so much about who we are today. He is the great liberator. He is the great lover. He is the great father, affection giver, friend. And he just makes it easy and we make it complicated. If I see God in the light of who Jesus is, okay. These are the things that I feel are the three things that stop us from really living out a life of significance. The number one thing is self-hatred. We've been taught to hate ourselves. You've been taught that you're fill in the blank. 
not good enough, not holy enough, doesn't, you don't measure up, you're not worthy. We've been taught all of these things, fill in the blank. Number one thing that stops us from living our significant self-hatred, number two, performance. <clears throat> performance is what, we, what orphans do to get the attention of a father that they don't know they already have. How do we break performance? Live for an audience of one and love the whole world. That's how you break performance. Um, and it's a lifestyle. It doesn't happen overnight. Especially when all we know is how to be little monkeys and perform. And all we're taught is that you're just, you know, Pinocchio on strings and God's moving you where he wants you. No, you have free will. You have a life. You have your own volition. You really basically do what you want. Live for an audience of one and break performance. The third thing is perfectionism. <clears throat> and my dear friend in Vegas preached an awesome message about what perfectionism is and, wasn't and what it isn't. And she says, perfectionism... Is not wanting is is not the same thing. Like we we say, um, we kind of say, well, if you want perfectionism, then you're just you know we kind of make it this negative word, and it is a negative word. But let me tell you what the positive word is: excellence. Yeah. And they're not the same thing. Perfectionism is a worship of things being in our control and wanting them to be a certain way. When you live a life of excellence, that's different. So let God break those three things off of us, self-hatred, performance, and perfectionism. There's this T.F. Torrance quote, and it says, It is only in and through Jesus Christ that man's eclipse of God can come to an end, and he can emerge again out of darkness and into light. When we see who Jesus is, when we see who God is in the face of Jesus, and he reveals what God really looks like, we can come out of darkness and into light. Let his light shine on us. Let his light shine on the dark places. The gaze of the Father is the key to being the light of the world. How many are just excited about what's actually going on in the world? Um, one of my friends, she's a preacher, she preached a thing this week, and it was like this powerful one-minute word, and she said it is time for the church to be who they're called to be, which is light and darkness. It is the, it is the church's finest hour right now. You know, when you live in a city like Las Vegas and you preach where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. When you live in a city like that, you can look at the way the world is today. And I can say where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. And you see revival in the streets. See, oh, I have to read this quote to you guys. Um, we were listening to Bill Johnson this week. And he said, anyone who has more input from the media than the word of God, their discernment is self-inflicted. I'm sorry, their discouragement is self-inflicted. I'll read it again. Anyone who has more input from the media than the word of God, their discouragement is self-inflicted. Kind of hurts, right? Hey. I read this other thing this week about um, um, the, it's like the Hebrew year of, you know, sometimes I'm just like, it's always the Hebrew year or something, but <laughs> it's, but it happens to be the he Hebrew year of the mouth. I find it interesting all over the world. See, I think COVID's demonic because I want to smile at people. I want to hug people. I want to get right in somebody's face at the grocery store and say, you are loved by God. Right. Isn't it demonic that the response would be, we have to wear masks and social distance? That is the devil if I have never heard it. And let me tell you, the church right now, if you look all over the country, the church is responding in glory. 
the church is going out of the walls and into the streets. Revival is happening everywhere. It is. It is. If you tune into the right station, if you tune into the right heart, if you turn off the static and the noise, you know, I love um, politics and I love what's happening. I love, I just listen to it all the time. So, like, I think it was like three months ago before we moved here, my husband was like, okay, honey, I can't listen to it every day. You got to stop. Like, it's done. I'm done. I was like, fine. I'll listen to my podcast and my AirPods. But it's true when you turn off the noise and you open your heart to what God is saying. And where is our source? Where are we finding our strength? Where is our hope coming from? Where is our meat coming from? Where is our purpose coming from? Because if it's coming from CNN or Fox or MSNBC, it is the wrong spirit. Okay, I don't know where I was going, but there we go. Oh, the light of the world, that's where I'm at. We are the light of the world. And the only way that we can be the light is if we know who we are, because then we shine the light. Because our reality of how much we know the Father is going to be revealed and how much we shine his light. You cannot be a conduit of what you don't know. You cannot be a conduit of what has not become real to you inside of you. Um, so I'm just going to make a bold statement. I know that my husband and I are conduits for revival. Why? Because I've seen it and experienced it, and I believe it in my heart. If you don't know who you are, if you don't know what you carry, you cannot be a conduit for it. And so when you know God in the light of his son, you can be a conduit for who he really is. Um, without knowing who we are, we are not able to be equipped as the ecclesia, as the called out church. And the world is crying for the called out church. The world is crying for what real church looks like. The world right now is more ripe for the harvest than probably it's ever been. And if we don't choose to see it, it's because we're not, the reality of who God is, is not taking place deep in our heart. We cannot be a conduit of what we don't know. And if you feel like the world is evil, going to hell in a handbasket tomorrow, you cannot be a conduit for revival. Because the conduit for revival says hope, destiny, life is in the streets. <laughs> what you know is what you're a conduit of. That's why most churches don't win the lost. Because they're not a conduit of love for the lost. When you walk into a church and it's mostly one color because the people are not a conduit for anything else. Is that too much? Okay. Jesus, help me. Spicy honey. Spicy honey. What our, what our reality is what we know to be real is what we release in the earth. Amen. Do people like you? I mean, they love you because they have to, and you're in church. We have to love each other because we're Christians. But are you liked where you go? Are you liked in your circles? If you are, that means you're a conduit of love. And if you're not, get a revelation of who Jesus is because he was loved by the world and rejected by the religious. Yeah. Gazing at the Father gives me an awareness and a knowledge and an understanding of who he really is. And that is what I live out. So for me and for my heart, understanding that a broken little girl from an inner city house and a single mom family, I can be a conduit of love and hope and resurrection. Why? Because I see how he sees me. This morning when we were singing the vamp, I was just, my heart was just like, you see me, you know me, you love me. It's one thing to know that God loves you. It's another to know that God sees you and still loves you. Like he sees you. 
like the Friday you, the Monday you, <laughs> not just the Sunday pretty version, right? Yeah. Without knowing who we are and knowing who God is, we will not be able to be the called out church that he's called us to be. Amen? Amen. That's it. I love you guys. Let me pray. All right. Thanks, Lenny. Lenny's awesome. She's here from Pennsylvania. She's our friend. Say hi. We're not manipulative, but we're praying that she moves here. Just kidding. Father, I thank you that you are not scary. You are not distant. I thank you that you're close and you're gentle with me and you love me. And I pray as a church and as a community that we would come under the reality of how you see us and we would begin to live out our significance in a way that says it doesn't matter what I do, it doesn't matter how I perform, it doesn't matter what it looks like, I don't need to control, I don't need to fear, I just need to learn to sit in your love for me. I pray we get it as a people and we live it out loud. I thank you for every person in this room, every heart here. I pray they'd hear my heart and just, just attach their heart to mine and say, let's do this. Thank you for your presence, God. I really, I just feel like I need to say this to maybe especially this service, but when we were praying about moving here, one of the significant things I felt like the Lord showed me was there's this really precious group of people for whatever reasons they just they're just very precious to the Lord and it was like he lifted up this congregation and he said I need someone who will go I need someone who will say yes and he looked all over the earth and he said who's gonna go who would who would say yes to them and he said Zach would say yes that's how I feel about this church that you guys were so on the heart and the mind of Christ he lifted your hearts up somebody needs to go Love them well. Release them in their destiny. Let hope arise and see revival in their city. Amen. I love you guys. Thank you so much. And I pray you have a beautiful, beautiful Sunday. Josiah is going to come and dismiss you.